Now, I'm going to quote a scripture for you before we get started. We've been doing a series called New Creation Realities. And today is called the Four Pillars of Strength. Now, let's read our scripture. This is Psalms 23. You know it. The Lord is my shepherd. Hey, let's all read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Key. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the earth, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will listen to the next phrase. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, folks, the house of the Lord is not just this building. The house of the Lord is that secret place that you walk with Christ. Okay. All right, we're going to show you the house of the Lord today. Because I got four sermons within a sermon. Oh, my goodness. No, we're just going to go through some, some pillars. There are four pillars that I want to go over with you that you need to have down as a believer. Now, there are truths. So here's, here's some where, where we kind of get off. We think that God's going to make us read our Bible. God isn't going to make you read your Bible. God is not going to make you want to go to church. God is not going to make you do anything because you have a human will, which means you can make a choice whether to or whether not to. God always comes and appeals to our will. Can you say amen? And the Bible says if we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. In other words, we'll obey God and we'll, and we'll do what he asks us to do we will be favored and God will favor us and we'll eat the good of the land. Look at Abraham. He was called the friend of God. Have you walked with God and been religious? Or have you learned to walk with God and he's at friends with you? When you make friends, you're not enemies any longer. All right, let me quote you a scripture. Not this one. You can pull that down. The Bible says, Agree with your adversary while you are on the way with him. Lest at any time he deliver you over to the officer. The officer take you to the judge and the judge sentence you. You will not get out of prison until you've paid the whole debt. What's that talking about? Let's see how much you walk with God. You see, when we were sinners, God forbid, when we were without God in our hearts, we were an adversary to God. Because who lived in us? The devil. Speak for yourself. The devil didn't live in me. Oh, yes, he did. And he wants, and God wants him out. Can you say amen? So before we're saved, we're an adversary to God. That's why in the Old Testament, Ground opened up and swallowed Jews and Gentiles alike. Why? Because they weren't born again. God did not dwell in them. All he understood in the Old Testament is obedience to his wishes or God's commands. Can you say amen? And when they weren't followed, destruction was the end result. But thank God we're in the New Testament. Amen. So agree with your adversary while you're on the way with them. God, I surrender Forgive me my sin. That's how you agree with your adversary when you're a sinner. You have to surrender. Because the parts you don't, and I'll listen, the parts you don't surrender to God are the ones that Satan's choking you with. 
Let's just pause for a minute and think about that. All right. Very important. Sometimes, I've told you, sometimes we're our own worst enemy because we have to be reprogrammed. When you get on your phone, you want it to function, don't you? Amen. Otherwise, you know, you have to get a new phone. Amen. Well, God wants you to be able to function on his go juice. Can you say amen? God, two letters in God are go. Go juice. God dwells in cans, and he doesn't dwell in cans. I can do all things through Christ. So you make peace with God so he doesn't turn you over to the the officer, which are demons, and demons turn you over to the unfair judge, and the judge throws you in. Now think about it. Can you pay your own, pay for your own sin? Unpayable debt. So you made peace with your adversary, and God paid your debt through Christ. Aren't you glad? Now, maybe you didn't hear a gospel like that before, but that's okay. Different strokes for different folks. I like to preach the truth that is clear. Can you say amen? All right. God told me a long time ago, and we'll get started now. God told me a long time ago, if I was going to move in more power in my life, this is for somebody here today, I've got to really watch my mouth. Don't start putting yourself down, putting others down. Don't run around, start blaming and gossiping because you won't have a bit of power at all. You've done shorted it all out. You go around and you gird up the loins of your lips. Proverbs 6, 2, don't be snared by the words of your mouth. Amen. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So God told me, he said, Carrie, if you want to move in more power, then you're going to really have to watch what you say and what you do. Say amen, somebody. Well, good morning. Let's get into it. All right. Okay, the four pillars of strength that we need to have every day. Okay, these are things that are a must. These aren't things that you could just go without. Okay, these aren't things that God does for you. These are things that you do for God so he can utilize you better. You see, if you have a broken bike and you need to bike to work, you got to fix the broken bike. Well, why always breaking the bike? Let's get the bike fixed. Then let us get it remodeled. Let's put an engine on it. Let's get it really going. See, Christianity is is not going from one attack to the next attack. It's going from one victory to the next because our eyes are on the author and the finisher of our faith. They're on our great shepherd who leads us not into temptation, but delivers us from the evil one. That's you. Amen. All right, let's get into this. No one can make a foundation that's under our feet, Jesus Christ, any stronger or any weaker. God is God. Can you say amen? Now, the key to get that strong foundation under our feet is the principle of hearing and doing. Everyone say hearing Hearing. and doing. So if God says, I want you to pray this morning, you hear it. And then you, because when you hear it and you do it, it builds strength in you. Hello. Every time you hear and do, it builds strength. Every time you hear, you do, it builds foundation under your feet where the winds come and the floods blow, but it cannot shake it because it's founded on the rock. Hearing and doing, hearing and doing. Everyone say hearing and doing. Now, God is building his house. We know Psalms 127 says, Except the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Well, let's take it right down to the house. Let's say you are the house. Not the building. You are the temple of the living God. You're the house, right? And who builds the house? Don't look at me like you don't know what you're saying. God builds a house. So who's building your life? You or God? 
Uh, all right. So now what you need to do is ask him, how much is you and how much is God? And let him readjust. Because the house that God builds, no one can take down. And that's you. You are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will walk in them, and I will talk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, saith the Lord. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Hello. Now, here you're having a, a wedding rehearsal, and somebody walks in, they just fell in a whole bunch of manure. Wouldn't you want them to clean up before they came in? Well, that's what God's doing. He's cleaning this up. Everyone look at somebody and say, I'm not cleaning you up. God's cleaning you up. So as we walk with God and as we get in the word, as we pray, God is transforming us from within. We're actually changing. Now, it has to do with how often you do that. If you only do it once in a while, then you're going to get once in a while growth. If you do it consistently, daily, it doesn't have to be long, pouring yourself out, surrendering, sometimes sobbing, getting soaked in the marinade, you'll grow speedily. Because being with God, he removes all the things that hinder the seed from germinating and from the tree from growing. Even though a mustard seed be less than all the other seeds, when it is planted, it will spring up and become larger than most things. Even the fowl of the air, Satan, will love to come and hang around its branches. You see, I'm going to tell you this. A word church, not a weird church. A word church, Satan keeps people from coming. Because the most important thing God wants us to get is understanding of his word. Without that, you're going to live a guessing Christianity. You're guessing, you're hoping that things are well. And, and some of you survived through that. I did. But God wants you to know how to place your feet. He wants you to understand how the principle works. The best way to get up with God is to get out on your knees. To strip yourself from your own self and allow God to rebuild the house. How many's ever had a remodeling in your real house? Wouldn't that fun? Except for the money part. Well, Jesus already paid for the renovation of our home. Now we got to put ourselves into his presence so he can change the outward man and quiet it. Because we have a lot of problems with our outward man. Whether you like it or not, when your eyes are on you, you'll get depressed. I, am, I, can, I don't have this and I don't have that. And you'll talk your right self right into depression. That's a principle that you're using in reverse. You need to understand that. So, man, if you're feeling really down and really funky, shut up. Don't say a thing. Don't say nothing. Just get in there and start thanking God and asking God to help you. Because it's not what goes in a man that defiles us. It's what comes out of our lips that defiles us. Man, I tell you what. I just gave you something that will change your life forever. Though we know it, will we do it? Though we know it, will we do it? There's the key. Now, I'm not picking on you. I love you with all my heart. I want you to be a better Christian, a better person than me. I want you to have a handle on the word of God so you can share with everybody the truth. Because Jesus says you'll know the truth and the truth shall what? All right, so the four pillars of strength, being as I like to talk a lot. All right, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. Look at verse 9 to 11. First Corinthians 3, verse 9, 10, and 11. For we are God's fellow workers. Say amen. Say I'm a worker. That means you're sowing. Amen. We sow and then we reap. Okay. He says you are God's workers. You are God's what? What do we plant in fields? 
seed. So let God people speak in your life. You know, Satan has set it up where people can't correct, people can't speak into somebody's life because they think you're being corrected all the time. And if you're like that, you got to die. I should be able to talk to you and say, here, I noticed four or five things that you need to really be cautious about and not get offended and get mad and leave the church. That's my job is to give you what you need so you can practice it and God and you can make it come to pass. Say amen, somebody. Amen. You want somebody like me in your house? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gee, thank you, Mike. I appreciate you. I'll give you that five bucks after you said that. All right, so listen, this is really important. So we are God's workers. We are God's field. Now look at this next phrase. And we are God's what? Building. Everyone, go like this. I'm God's building. So who is building you up? What is your building for? Well, it says in Peter. Our job is we are living stones being built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices of praise to God. Your life is a praise life. Don't run around and tell everybody why it's not working. Tell them what God's doing in your life. Well, if he hasn't done a whole lot, he loves you and you're not in hell. Count your blessings, name them one by one, you know? That's the key. How are you looking at your life? Are you seeing yourself dead but alive to God? Are you seeing yourself that you've got to figure life out, and if you can't figure it out, you're going to be tormented? That's what we do. We want to try to figure God out. I found out, Brian, that if I get God figured out in my head, he's now too small to deal with my problems. <laughs> All right, David, don't look at me in that total voice. <laughs> anyway, let's go into this. I really want to share with you. So you are God's building. According to grace of God that was given to me, Paul said, I'm a wise master builder, and I have laid the foundation, Jesus Christ, and another builds on us. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm giving you Jesus, but in your life when you're walking with Jesus, you need to have these four pillars, and you need to build the consistency of those pillars in your house. Now, if, you, if you've got a house that looks like a box that just has four points, we'll, we'll make it easy. Those pillars are their four points on that house. Holds up the roof, holds up the walls, but the foundation holds up the whole building. Who's the foundation? Jesus. But we need certain pillars in our life to hold up the rest of our life. So let's go into them, shall we? Everyone say, yeah! yeah. First pillar is you better learn how to pray. First pillar, better learn. well, I know how to pray. I bet you I can tell you four or five things that you didn't even know in praying. And the only reason I know them is somebody taught me you see, God shared with me. So prayer is your first pillar. If you don't have a prayer life with God, you're going to fail. You might not fail miserably. You might have some successes. But you're like you're down in Las Vegas pulling the crank. You're hoping you're winning one day. See, your life is not that way. Let God pull your crank. You're going to have lots of favor. Because he can see everywhere at once. He's ahead of you in your future. He's behind you in your past. He heals back here. He gives you inspiration up here, but he's with you in the present. Amen. I just love that. I got up this morning. Power of God was all over me. I knew some of you were praying for me already. You early risers. Amen. Early bird catches the worm. Yep. Is that what it was? <laughs> Moving right along. Okay. Now, he says, all right, but take heed how you build thereon. Give you a couple of points. Number one, we are God's fellow workers, fields, and building. Let's talk about the building, our own lives. How's it going? Is there, not just, I don't want you to answer me, but I want you to think about what I'm saying. 
Are there some areas of your life that God really needs to work in to help you? Yes, there is. The key part is don't get in denial about them. Don't put them on the back burner and say, well, God will get to it. You go to God and say, Lord, I have a trouble. Con- uh, let's, I'll, I'll use me. I have a problem being concerned about people, you know, showing up at church and being faithful to you, God. It bothers me. So, Lord, I come to you and I don't want it to bother me because the bother part is not really right. So I'm asking you to not let it bother me, but let me pray so that, that I can pray for them so they don't do that. You see? So God takes over that. And next thing you know, the things that used to bother you don't bother you anymore. How many here? Now I want to show hands. Have had some things in the past don't bother you anymore, but used to bother you. Yeah. You see, you are growing. Things are changing in your life. But it has to do with your exposure to God. And it has to do with prayer. Go with me to Matthew, please. We're going to have support you with a scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. How did you get saved? Prayer. So you started off saying, Father, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Take over my life, right? If you haven't done that, please do, because God goes by invitation. He doesn't go by trespassing. That's the devil that trespasses. Okay? All right, so here verse 6 says, But you, everyone say me. Here's your chance to go, me, 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 me. <laughs> At church, you know, most of the time I say, forget about it. You know. It says, but you, I love this. Listen really carefully. But you, when you pray, didn't say if you pray. It says what? When. How often, when do you pray? Well, the Bible says pray without ceasing. Now, see how I can master that. If you want to know what that means, I'll, I'll explain that to you. That means every time you see something wrong, just pray about it right away. If you're wondering, if something good's coming your way and you don't know, pray about it right away. Something is coming in and disrupting your flow, pray about it right away. That's being in season, out of season. Can you say amen? Because when we pray, we move God into our situation. When we pray, we bring God into the situation or into our situation. You have an hour or something that that needs to be fixed in our heart. We all do. You have to say, Lord, could you fix my anger? Could you fix this? Lord, I suffer with this. Now, what you're saying is you're admitting your fault to God. And then you're asking God to come fix it. You don't run around all day long admitting your fault. That's what we do when our eyes are on ourselves. We talk about our problems all the time. Stop that. It isn't about you. I thought you died. Hello? Paul talked this way. Do you think Paul had a lot of friends? Some. The ones that died to themselves. But Paul was always getting in trouble. Why? Because of the pure word he preached. It didn't tickle. Didn't make us feel good. But it certainly gave us the answers. Amen. Amen. Paul says of himself, I'm the least of all the apostles. All right. So your first pillar is prayer. How often do you pray? Has any of you ever prayed more than two hours at once? If you haven't, try the experience. Set off the time to do it. And when you're praying, don't always talk. Make the request, listen and worship. Make the request, listen and worship. All things through prayer and supplication. Make the request and worship. Make the request. Lord, your word says, and I just worship you because I know you're right on it, God. Thank you, Jesus. Do you talk to God that way? He's my friend. He's your friend too. So befriend him. You know for a good friend, you, you've been through heaven and hell with good friends. You know, and you can't really pick a lot of good friends. There's just, there are only a few, okay? But let's make God our friend. Let's befriend him. And you might say, he's holy, he's righteous. How could I befriend God? Abraham did, and he was Old Testament. You befriend God by talking to him all day long. Hey, God, what do you think about this? I'm kind of concerned. I don't really know. 
You know, that's how Scott talks with God. And he goes through there, Lord, I really want to know what you're going to be doing to my life. My life. I know that everything's going to be kosher and good. And so we have to talk. And as we're walking with God, we're talking with God. Walking with God and talking with God. Amen. When I get up in the morning, I walk to the bathroom with God. <laughs> and I sit on the only throne that I'm worthy to sit on. Let's laugh a little bit. That's the reason why I said it. There's your throne. There's where you're ruling from. Good analogy, isn't it? Because we want God to be, to be ruling in our lives. We want to be subject to him and his wisdom and, and his instruction. Amen. Moving right along. So first pillar is prayer. Amen. Notice it says, when you pray, not if you pray. Prayer is designed for you to bring heaven and saturate your life. Folks, I love the presence of God. The first time I ever fasted, I lived in South Prairie. Anybody know where South Prairie is? Yes. Anybody watching know where South Prairie is? I lived in my sister's house when she moved to Texas. It was a four-bedroom wood heat house, okay, for $75 a month. And I got saved in that house. Amen. Went through a lot of supernatural things. So I was fasting. I was about on my third day of a seven-day fast. If you want to know more about fasting, I'll share with you. It's one of the things when you fast. It didn't say if you fast. When you fast. Fasting is a way we show God that we are really serious. Okay? We are absolutely so serious. We're giving up food and water to hear from God. Hello, Isaiah 58, get a chance to read it, okay? So I was on my three-day fast, and of course, at that time, I was with somebody that really wasn't spiritual, and they knew I was fasting, so what did they do? They cooked steak <laughs> for me yep. on purpose, yep. just to see if I'd break my fast to shove it into my mouth. What a picture God gave me with that. So I says, God, what do you want me to do? He says, son, I want you to get on your bicycle. I had a 10-speed at that time, much thinner feet, you know. Anyway, so I get on my bicycle. I pull out the points, get on my bicycle. I start to ride out past my hedge, and I get about half a block, just to half a block. There's a crowd of people, and they're all upset. And, uh, so I rode my bike, I put my kickstand down, walk right up, and the lady that lives next door is having a heart attack. And immediately, God had me push them all away, not shove them away, <laughs> kind of push them out. I went to her, and I grabbed her hand. I says, Jesus is here. And as soon as I said that, I didn't know what to say. I just said the truth. Jesus is here. Now, these were all Assembly God Christians. They're all freaked out and worried, making the lady freaked out and worried for her heart. They needed to be quiet and go somewhere. Jesus put them out. And so I just walked up, not even knowing what I'm doing. I says, Jesus is here. And she was healed instantly. I says, you go get some water. You go this. And you go do this. You go look up that. And everything. finally, they all left. It's you, her, and I. And she says, you're such a fine person. I didn't know you loved Jesus. I didn't know what I was going to do getting on the bike. But God did. See, all you have to do is be willing to be led by God. Be willing to get yourself adjusted, which we do. Listen, God used the donkey in the Old Testament. Amen. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. So if he can use a donkey, he can use me. All right, let's go to the second. All right. Second pillar. How many know you better pray now? These are the end times, folks. These are the very end of the end times. I mean, we've got war going on in Europe. Magog and Gog. Okay? Really on the time. Okay? Second pillar is the importance of God's word. This church, if it's going to be known for anything, it's going to be known for God's word and God's love. You're going to get the word here. 
Scott's known me. How many years have you known me? Never mind. He long, time. long time. Have you ever noticed me preach anything besides the word? No, it's a word. Peggy, how long have you known me? Over 40 years. Over 40 years. What's wrong with these longevity Christians? What? Come on, you can get mad at me and go find your own church. That's, that's exactly what kind of maturity we have in the Northwest. You get mad and go find somebody. Oh, I don't want to drive that far to church. We'll never have a revival in your heart if you don't sacrifice your selfishness. Make yourself uncomfortable to come early and learn. When you do that, God sees that you are serious and not just hanging out. Now remember, he loves those to hang out with him. But he also wants us to get somewhere. Can you say amen? So you want to look in the mirror and you want to see that you're spiritually changing and not just switched your makeup. <laughs> All right, let's move right along. Or dyed your hair. Now, no, I have nothing wrong with that. You know? Hey, one time, one time I got insecure as a minister. And when I had hair, I had it permed. Boy, that wasn't me at all. And so, and, and so what I did is I know my hairdresser, and they both go to, would got, got to my church. So I know, I know her. I called her up. And I says, what do I do? My pillow's got hair all over it. I said that to her. She says, what? I said, I'm just joking with you. That was back when I was a little bit, you know, but I had all this frizzy, curly, afro, hairy. It just wasn't me at all. I looked in the mirror and went, oh, wow. Moving right along. Our second pillar is the word of God. Who could quote John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Hello. So in the beginning, the Father, the word, the Holy Spirit. Now the word is a person. But he wasn't called the son of God in heaven in the beginning. He was called the word. But the word became flesh. And he was begotten of a virgin. You see? see? Now, I, many churches don't even touch that. Oh, he always was the son of God. No, he wasn't. He was God. The father was God. Jesus was God. Holy Spirit's God. Those three are in absolute equality. You cannot separate them. Anybody that's healed, saved, they're all free, active. Can't separate them. Holy Spirit doesn't run around saying, I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm part of God. No, Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Holy Spirit says, come to Jesus. Be with Jesus. Holy Spirit's job is to lift Jesus up in your heart. It's not to take any credit away from the focus point. Everyone say, Jesus is my focal point. That's right. He's your eyeglasses. You see the world through him. Moving right along. So the second pillar is the word of God. Job 23, 12. Let me quote it for you. I have not departed from the commandments of your lips. I have treasured your words, God, of your mouth more than my necessary food. So the word of God should be more important than stuffing your face with food. And if it hasn't gotten that way, ask God to help you put it first. Second of all, Psalms 119 verse 130 says, the entrance of God's word into our heart gives light. Okay, and then it says, and he gives understanding to the simple. Read Proverbs 1 sometime, and you'll find out how that wisdom cries out, to the simple. How long will you simple ones ignore instruction? Go ahead and read Proverbs chapter 1 sometime. And you can hear God's wisdom speaking to anyone that would listen. How about you? Are you a good listener to God? Or are you running around doing your own thing for God? Think about it. All right, so this pillar is the word. Listen to John 1.1. 1, 1. Who can quote it again in the beginning? word amen and the word was with God and the word so if it was he still is so when you sit down with your Bible you're sitting down with whom 
So I asked the Bible to come alive. Jesus, would you make it come alive to me? Well, I don't know where to read. Where you been? Get to know the focal point, Jesus. Everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, everything Jesus, the way he healed everything in the book of John will describe the second person of the Godhead. You'll discover that second person is the one that was called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. All right. 2 Peter 1.10, listen to what it says here. Therefore, brethren, that's you. Okay, so our second pillar is the word. Here's the key. For years, I, I, I told people, God can only work with you according to where your word level is. Everyone say word level. So if you only know a little bit, God will work with you within that little bit. But you're not going to be doing any mighty things until you grow in the understanding of the word. Can you say amen? Now listen to this quote. This is in uh, James chapter 1, verse 18. He says that God brings us forth by the word of his mouth. So if we're never in the word, he can't bring us out of ourself and have it face ourselves. You see, the Bible says, if you're a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like a man who forgot that you were saved, and you're looking at your natural face in the mirror, and you go walking away, and you forget all the things that God has instructed you, and you're doing your own thing again. But he that listens to the perfect law of liberty and continues thereof, this one will be blessed in what they do. James 1, 22 to 26. Are you with me? So, you now know that the word of God is a must. It's the wood to the fire of God that burns in your heart. Shove the word in your heart. Even if you don't understand it all, shove it into your heart. Speak it out loud. Speak it out. Even if you don't understand it, it's feeding your spirit, not your understanding. It leaks back up into your understanding when you're ready to know what it is. Meanwhile, just get into the Word. Keep feeding the Word. How many here have medicine you have to take in order to survive or, or to maintain? Well, the Bible says the Word is medicine to all your flesh. And if you won't get in it, you're not going to get better. That's just the way it is. So I don't know. I wish I could just unscrew the top of your head, pour in some wordies, screw the top of the head up and go goose, 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 and have it get into you so that you know. Because well, it's hard for me to listen to conversations when everything they're saying is contrary to the word. The greatest temptation I have when I hear people talking like that is to want to give them some advice. And many times I bit my tongue because it would have just created a problem. But listen, before you open your mouth and insert your foot, consider what you say. Consider what the word says. Consider your life, okay? Everybody can see where you're at and where you're not. So don't try to brag ahead of who you are. You stay humble and godlike. And somebody says, man, you're a real blessed guy. You can just simply say, it's only because of God. See? That way, you don't have to defend your relationship with God. God will defend his relationship with you. What you cover, God will expose. What you uncover before God, God will cover. So if you think you're getting away with anything, not at all. And you're headed for a great expose of exposure. <laughs> Being caught with your pants down. Hello? I'm not referring to it naturally, but I'm your hands in the cookie jar, you know what I mean? So you get to thinking, oh yeah, you know, oh God, you know, no, God is being favorable to you and letting you do that thing until one day he won't anymore. And when that happens, don't you dare do it because you're liable to die. When it comes right up, when God says it's enough, it's enough, you stop that. That's because he loves you. Those are rare occasions because I don't think any of you are, are ignorant enough to kill yourself. Hello. 
Killing a per when you think about taking your life and you gave your life to God, you're stealing. And that's what took it to hell. Hard to hear. Well, I have friends who have committed suicide. So have I. Did they make it? Everybody's individually ministered by God at the moment of that happening. Our job is not to judge. Can you say amen? All right. So, second pillar, third pillar. We have a, a triplets. Everyone say triplets. triplets. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is love or charity. Charity means love for others, love in action, okay? It's just an old English word for love in action. Okay, so now abides faith, hope, charity, and the greatest of these is charity, right? Let me ask you. The third pillar is our faith. Okay? This third pillar, without faith, it's impossible to what? Yeah, Hebrews eleven six, 6. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently, aggressively, going after Ali, seek him. You show me a man diligent in his actions, and I will set him before kings, God says. Show me a lazy man, and he will come to poverty. Proverbs. Okay, so faith comes by what? Okay, you see, we pray, we're in the word, we hear the word of God, and how does our faith come? By the words that we hear. So listen, somebody shared with you about Jesus, and then Peggy came and watered, and somebody else came and kind of straightened up your earth, and next thing, Christ started taking form in your life. Can you say amen? But folks, I'm going to tell you, when you hear the word, faith is not the first thing that comes. There's something that comes that's hidden. Because we know now faith is the substance of things. Hope comes first. Because faith brings substance to things hoped for. Hope is like a thermostat in your house. You want it colder, you dial it down. You want it hotter, you dial it up. This is how it works. Now listen. This will set you free if you'll listen. We read scripture. It paints pictures and gives us a different narrative of hope. Your life says you're just a louse. But God says I love you and I want to free you and I want to give you. So when you hear the word, the first thing that comes is pictures of God's promises. Why, Pastor Kerry? Because faith needs something to work towards. So all of you have is negative pictures of your life, and you're not believing for anything that God's promised you in your word. Faith leaves dormant. So get in the word, and you ask God to start showing you things in your life. Now you're seeing pictures and you're hearing promises and all of a sudden your faith is starting to work. But folks, there's another element that's missing that keeps our faith working so we don't go into roller coaster walk. You know, roller coaster walk, you're up one minute and something happens. Now listen, when you do things good, Satan's going to counterattack you. You got something really good done and don't sit on your laurels and say, oh, that's great, isn't that great? No, he's going to come and kick your face if you don't have your armor on. And that's exactly what he does. When you get a victory, you see things change and coming together, you better get your armor on, and you better face the enemy if he starts to come with a counterattack. Why would he do that, Pastor Kerry? To make us look foolish. Steal from us the joy God says when we have an answer to prayer, it says that so shall your joy be full. Are you with me? So our pillar of faith. So we're stuck. We look at the word. We hear a good sermon from Pastor Kerry. Hallelujah. You know, and we're seeing God pictures. That's what those pictures are. Now your faith is moving you to that direction. Now, that faith will move you maybe to prayer so God can energize that area. Or that faith may move you to share. 
or that faith may move you to pray. But once you get to consult the word, it's given you a different picture of hope that your faith automatically starts working. Now, to keep your faith working so it doesn't have lows and highs is faith worketh by love. If you can't love people and start correcting them and criticize them, I got people that will discuss me in the church at home when they've been told not to. Don't ever do that. Because then all of a sudden you'll rise up from that discussion with a different opinion of how I feel. Now we're at division. Because you discussed things that you shouldn't have without the people present that you should have there. You see, it's called a trick of the enemy. Like, for example, let's say nobody's met this wonderful man, Scott. So I tell you, I want you to be careful because Scott's coming today. Now, he's a good man, but... Now, what I'm doing is I'm just faking a, a, a scenario. But people do that. Here, God wants lots of people here, but we have a few people running around telling people, don't go there, don't go there. You know what God will do? He'll slap them down if they don't quit. Read it, it's in 1 Corinthians 3. He will destroy those that destroy the church. Boy, that's sobering, and that's New Testament. Remember Ananias and Sapphira. I think we have forgotten the fear of the Lord sometimes. And we don't be pulling things that we shouldn't. Moving right along. So, what's the first thing to come when you study or you hear the word? Hope. Boy, you guys, I'm really concerned. <laughs> Let's have another cup of coffee. Hope comes so it can give you pictures. The world's pictures that it's given you is not always good. There are plenty of opportunities that are good, but we want to hear God about them. Can you say amen? So we consult the word, it gives us hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, it says in Romans. So we hope for heaven. We hope for healing, total healing in our bodies. Don't stop. Hello? I'm amazed at how many parasitical Christians we have floating from church to church but never hear any of the word of truth. And the things they repeat are just tales. Yeah, let me tell you about that, Pastor. <laughs> Listen, I started a whole bunch of rumors years ago about myself just to see how they go around in the church. They went around the church. I mean, ridiculous ones. I married two women, moved to Alaska because I turned into a Mormon. That was mine. I was selling drugs at the Tacoma Mall. I, I started that one too. And that one got back to me. You say, why did you do that? Because I was mad at the church. I was mad at God's people. Because when I was broken, nobody reached out to help me. I had to go to California to get help. And some of these churches I helped start. That's tough on me. And I went to God. I says, God, what do I do about that? And he says, physician, heal yourself. What, what he was telling me is, there's nobody here that want to deal with you. Go somewhere where they don't know you and they can minister without prejudging. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So the third pillar is what? Faith. Faith has to have hope. So it can bring us to it. And faith has to have love to keep it going. Say amen. And our God is love. For God is love. Right? So when you, here's the key. When you operate in faith, now as a believer, you don't operate in your own faith. Don't look at me like you're confused. Who lives in your heart? Does he have faith? Yeah, now you're learning. Because the faith of you is good. Because without it, it's impossible to please God. But after a while you walk with God, get this, it moves from faith to trust. Now you're not trying to believe. You do because 
the one whose faith is in operation now is God's. So learn to turn God's faith loose and not your own. They work together tandemly. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see that you can be saved. You decide it says I can be saved. So I'm going to let love motivate me to be saved. You love God's word? Yes, then you better be in it. You say, well, sometimes it's just really hard. See, you're in your head now. You're analyzing before you read. The bridge is out. How do you know? I don't know. I'm just thinking it's out. See, we've got to understand a little bit about ourselves. Okay, so three pillars. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. Now you know how they all work. Say amen. That's why when you don't walk in love, nothing works. Because God is love. Last pillar. Everyone say last pillar. All right. Walking faithful to your call. The fourth pillar is walking faithful to the call. You got one call. Somebody else got another call. So let me talk about call for a minute. Remember the days when they had the dial phones? Remember? And you had your phone down by your bedroom. And you're out in the yard and the phone's ringing. And you're running into the house to grab the phone. It just says you go to pick it up. They hang up. That's not what God. God's calling on your life never stops. In fact, that's one of the things that you're going to have to answer for, how obedient to that call you are. So let me tell you, we're all called with this call. We all are called, but few are. You know, few choose the calling. All are called, but few choose to follow. All humans are called to salvation and to heaven, but only a few decide to follow. Okay? Say amen. So our, our, our call to heaven and call to God is meted out by the race that we run. And the race that we run is our life. So when God calls us, and the time that we go home to be with him, we have little minor assignments. See, God called me to him, didn't he? But one of my minor assignments in my call to him is to be a, a minister for him. What a responsibility. I thank him every day for that, that he would even consider somebody like me to minister the word. So you have callings within the call. You are all are called to heaven. Don't miss that. But on our journey, God's going to ask you to do certain things. He might rearrange you and put you into church and say, you'll be ushering. You know, you never know. But even those little things, God is directing us and building up our house. Hello. Amen. So listen, do not, I know this is a fact, do not put press board on an outside shed. Hello. Because once it gets water on it, it just it falls apart. Hello. So your foundation is not press board. It's Jesus. So we have four pillars that we make sure that are in our life. First one is prayer. Come on, memory. memory, memory. Second is God's word. Third one is faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is okay. And the fourth is loyalty to your call. Now, see, I tell people, they come up and get healing. I teach healing classes. I know how to get somebody healed. The trouble is when you have people coming up to the line to get be healed and they've never been taught on healing, you have to counsel them before they can get healed. And that just takes all the time for everybody who's waiting for everybody to get prayed for. It's time that church change. If you desperately need something, you get your bottom off that pew and you get up here and let's get some prayer for you. Don't sit there and wait for me always to come to you. And so, did you get something out of that this morning? Yes. Let's give the Lord praise. Bless you and keep you. May the Lord.